Hello and welcome to the 2021 Kemp Foundation's Teaching Excellence Award Ceremony. Through the years, the Teaching Excellence Award has undergone several name changes, but its purpose has always been to recognize and celebrate the vital role that teaching plays at Illinois Wesleyan. The award honors annually one faculty member who brings spirit, passion, and scholarship to the art of teaching. The Kemp Family Foundation began funding the award in the 2009-2010 academic year. And you may find a listing of all previous winners in the program published online. Today, we honor Tom Lutze. Dr. Lutze completed graduate studies at Cornell University, Peking University, and the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he earned his PhD in 1996. He joined Illinois Wesleyan as an assistant professor of history in 1996, was promoted to associate professor in 2002, and to professor in 2010. Dr. Lutze specializes in Asian history and teaches a wide variety of courses, ranging from introductory surveys of China and Japan to focused courses on 20th century Asia, including World War II in the Pacific, the Chinese Revolution, modern Japan, and the Vietnam Wars. He is also the coordinator of the Asian Studies team in the International Studies Program. Dr. Lutze is the 2020 recipient of the Kemp Foundation Award for Teaching Excellence at Illinois Wesleyan University. Nominated by his peers and selected by the university's Promotion and Tenure Committee, Dr. Lutze is the 47th winner of the university's Top Teaching Award. The Kemp Foundation has supported the university's award for teaching excellence since 2009. This award honors a faculty member who represents our highest ideals in terms of instruction. And we are delighted that the Kemp family and Kemp Foundation share our desire to recognize outstanding teaching at Illinois Wesleyan. As some of you know, Parker Kemp is a resident of Bloomington and served on our board of trustees for many years. In addition to funding this award, Parker and his children also made a gift several years ago that created the Glenn and Roseanne P. Kemp Commencement Plaza in front of State Farm Hall. Glenn and Roseanne were Parker's parents and were both graduates of IWU. Parker's daughter, Tony Jenkins, is here today. Tony, we thank you and all members of the Kemp family for your generous support of the university. Hello, I'm Tony Jenkins. On behalf of the entire Kemp family, I want to congratulate Professor Tom Lutze on receiving the 2021 Kemp Foundation Award for Teaching Excellence. Congratulations, Professor Lutze. It goes without saying that this past year has been eventful, challenging, and at times downright depressing. COVID-19, the murder of George Floyd, the contested elections, all with so much misinformation being spread and with such serious consequences. But there was one moment that to me was immensely encouraging. The widespread protests across the country and internationally targeting police brutality against people of color. Even here in Bloomington, we witnessed a large protest rally with a crowd of at least 1,000 demonstrators. This powerful movement, which galvanized around the slogan, Black Lives Matter, marked a major step forward in the long, ongoing struggle in our country against racism. Particularly striking to me was the understanding of the problem as one of systemic racism. As one African American recently maintained after the first week of the George Floyd murder trial, I think most of the things that are going on are systematic, more so than um, an individual person, such as the officer that killed George Floyd. As this comment succinctly points out, systemic racism suggests that 
Rather than being a problem of individual thoughts, attitudes, and behaviors, larger, deeper causes of discrimination and oppression exist, causes that inform and reproduce the racist thinking and behaviors that for centuries have permeated American society and continue to do so today. But as often as we may have used the term systemic racism, how deeply have we examined what system or systems we're talking about? And more, how should we, as we used to say when I was in college, go up against the system? It's an issue that I've been trying to get a better handle on for the past several months. I can't presume to have come up with definitive answers, but I'd like to extend the challenge to all of us today to grapple with these vital questions. But why in the world would I, a China historian, a professor of Asian studies, be wanting to address systemic racism with, and the larger systemic problems we face today? Perhaps a selected sketch of my personal background will provide an explanation. And I'm proud to be an Okie from Muskogee. Yeah, I was born in Muskogee, Oklahoma. This song by country singer Merle Haggard was written in 1969. It was a time of sharp divisiveness in America. Sound familiar? Not only over sex, drugs, and rock and roll, but perhaps more importantly, over the Vietnam War and black liberation struggles. Although Haggard claimed that he wrote the song as a joke, poking a bit of fun at some of the more conservative elements in American society at the time, Oki from Muskogee shot to the top of the pop charts and became one of the conservative anthems of the times, lauding the values of the 1950s status quo. Actually born in California, Merle was not a genuine Oki. I was. And my childhood would set me on a path clearly at odds with Haggard's depiction. You see, my dad was the pastor of a mission church in the African-American community of Muskogee. And when I was a toddler, he established a new congregation in the black community of nearby Tulsa. My social surroundings as a child were unusual. Ours was a white family, but we were deeply embedded in the life of the black community of North Tulsa. Oklahoma was in the South, where laws still enforced Jim Crow codes of racial segregation. Muskogee and Tulsa were also located in what had once been called Indian Territory. The capital of the Cherokee tribe, Tahlequah, was nearby, as was Okmulgee, capital of the Muskogee or Creek tribe. Here lived the descendants of those native peoples whose vast lands had once covered much of present-day Georgia and Alabama, but who had been subject to government policies of Indian removal, including the infamous Trail of Tears and forced to relocate to what became Oklahoma. So as a child in Tulsa, I was surrounded by friends embodying a multiplicity of racial and ethnic groups. In 1956, I entered kindergarten, the first year that Tulsa reluctantly desegregated its public schools in the wake of the historic Brown versus the Board of Education verdict two years earlier. So I headed off to school with my best friends, Scotty, who was white, Nancy, Indian, Thomas, African American. From my youngest days, interracial living and equality were natural to me. But I was to learn that my natural feelings as a five-year-old were not the reality in the larger society around me. Our church in North Tulsa was located in a community with a history both vibrant and horrifying. Greenwood, the center of North Tulsa, settled and built by formerly enslaved African Americans, had, by 1910, become so prosperous that it came to be known nationally as America's Black Wall Street. But in 1921, Greenwood became the site of one of the worst race massacres in U.S. history. Roused by a sensationalist newspaper report of a young black man assaulting a white woman uh, when he grabbed her arm in an elevator, a huge white lynch mob advanced on Greenwood with guns blazing and incendiary bombs dropped from airplanes overhead. Scores of Greenwood residents were killed. The whole community was burned down, leaving 10,000 people homeless amidst the ashes. Three decades later, when we moved to Tulsa, Greenwood had yet to be restored to its former prosperity. Through his work, 
Dad learned of this past and responded to ongoing racial injustices. He joined the local chapter of the NAACP, at that time the organization most active in confrontational politics against white supremacy. And he helped establish the Tulsa chapter of the Urban League, serving as its first secretary and its second president. He was the only white person to be invited to join the otherwise all African American Greenwood Chamber of Commerce. He was recognized in the community for his efforts, oftentimes successful, to counter the White Citizens Council, bigots who were engaged in intimidation campaigns to maintain segregated housing in the city. Dad described them as the Ku Klux Klan in business suits. In 1959, Dad accepted a position to work in the Lutheran Church's National Organization for Racial Justice. Its headquarters were supported by Valparaiso University where dad also joined the theology department. Our families moved north to Valparaiso, presented me with culture shock. Not only did my new third grade classmates tease the Oklahoma accent out of me, but Valpo more generally struck me for its all white racial homogeneity. Dad's work, however, now on the national stage, kept racial issues at the forefront of our family's dinnertime discussions. In 1963, he traveled to the nation's capital for the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, and he heard in person Dr. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. Just a few weeks after the D.C. March, we learned from one of Dad's pastoral colleagues in Birmingham, Alabama, that a bomb had exploded in the 16th Street Baptist Church, killing four little girls who were attending Sunday school. I had just turned 12. It was the first time in my life that I really began to feel shock, sadness, and anger at the reality of racism. These events of 1963 contributed to the passage the next year of the Civil Rights Act, but equality and freedom proved elusive. In 1965, protests over the killing of a voting rights activist by an Alabama state trooper led to the famous march from Selma to, to, to Montgomery. My dad and my oldest brother, Pete, who was then a college freshman, both traveled to Selma to join in the march. My dad and brother's participation in this historic event inspired in me a deep desire to follow their examples as what we would call today an ally of the black freedom movement. But 1965 marked another important turning point in American history. The US government was vastly increasing its support of South Vietnam's string of brutal anti-communist dictators by deploying combat troops for the first time, 189,000 by year's end. Within two years, the results of this expanding war were becoming clear, and Dr. King made a bold decision. On April 4, 1967, exactly one year to the day before he would be assassinated, King spoke at the Riverside Church in New York City linking the racial injustice at home with what he called the madness of Vietnam. His devastating critique of two decades of American actions in Vietnam were powerful, but his speech was entitled Beyond Vietnam. King did not address Vietnam as a horrific aberration of US policy, but rather as a symptom of what he called a far deeper malady in America. America, he charged, was on the wrong side of a world revolution as, quote, the need to maintain social stability for our investments, unquote, accounted for U.S. military involvement from Latin America to Southeast Asia. He quoted John F. Kennedy's observation from five years earlier, those who make peaceful revolution impossible make violent revolution inevitable. And this quote, by the way, inspired the title for my book, China's Inevitable Revolution. The words of this speech that came to resonate most powerfully with me were these. A true revolution of values will soon look uneasily on the glaring contrast of poverty and wealth. With righteous indignation, it will look across the seas and see individual capitalists of the West investing huge sums of money in Asia, Africa, and South America, only to take the profits out with no concern for the social betterment of the countries. And it will say, this is not just. Through this speech, Martin Luther King was identifying systemic linkages between white supremacy and the war in Vietnam. The analysis was not lost on me. 
The next two years, 1968 and 1969, were in many ways most pivotal to me, setting me on the trajectory that I have largely followed to the present. Not only did I endure the shock of the assassination of Dr. King, but I was close to its violent response. Nearby Chicago and more than one other, 100 other cities across the country exploded in rebellion. I asked my dad, a longtime proponent of nonviolence, how he assessed the destruction. He observed allegorically that every passenger train car is equipped with a case on the wall containing an axe and a fire hose. And the sign that directs the person, in case of emergency, break the glass. It was in the context of growing outrage across the U.S. that, now age 16, I came to meet a young, bright, articulate activist from a near west side suburb of Chicago, and to be introduced with him to representatives of the increasingly influential and rapidly expanding Black Panther Party. The young man's name was Fred Hampton. Fred, a budding student of the law, a gifted orator, and a dedicated revolutionary, soon rose to become chairman of the Illinois chapter of the BPP. Chairman Fred was guided by an analysis that capitalism had engendered racism, so that all of the struggles at that time, of all of the struggles at that time, class struggle was primary. The many oppressed people against the few oppressors. And for this reason, he worked tirelessly to organize what he described as the Rainbow Coalition. And here you can see how he considered the city of Chicago. The Black Panther Party would be the main organizers on the African American West Side. The Blackstone Rangers would be the South Side organizers. They were represented by the black stripe on the pin. The Young Lords, Puerto Ricans, would be organizing Lincoln Park. And the Brown Berets, the Chicana, Chicano organization, would organize Pilsen. Um, those two organizations, organizations were represented by the Brown Stripe. The Red Guard Party, the Asian American in Chinatown, the Yellow Stripe. The Young Patriots, poor Appalachian whites who lived in Uptown, were represented by the White Stripe. And the American Indian Movement, which also was centered in Uptown, was represented by the Red Stripe. In early 1969, several of my friends and I were invited to join the Rainbow Coalition by a member of the Panthers. And here is my button. As many of you may know from the recently re released movie, Judas and the Black Messiah, the FBI and the Chicago police saw Fred Hampton as such an effective organizer of the oppressed poor throughout the city of Chicago that in a pre-dawn raid on December 4th, 1969, they burst into his apartment, unleashed a fusillade of gunfire, and assassinated him along with fellow Panther from nearby Peoria, Mark Clark. My own activism emerged at this time. I participated with some friends in a project to build a house, a home, for an African-American mother from Chicago who wanted to move her family of six small children to Valpo from the notoriously drug-infested, gang-controlled public housing project of Cabrini Green. Years before Habitat for Humanity was established, and in spite of racist resistance in our community, our crew of volunteers erected a comfortable dwelling for this black family, breaking the color barrier in Valparaiso. Empowered by this experience, eight of us in high school formed a group we called Youth for Action. Yeah, thought it was positive. It was not long before Army recruiters came to our high school and we decided to express opposition. It was a significant moment. The previous week, the government had announced the highest number of U.S. casualties in Vietnam to date. And the U.S. Supreme Court had handed down its landmark Tinker v. Des Moines decision, upholding the First Amendment right of high school students to wear armbands in school to protest the war. On the day the recruiters came, all the junior and senior boys were summoned to the gym. Attendance was mandatory. To hear the recruiters tell us of our duties as Americans to fight communism and to tell us, laughingly, their stories of killing the enemy, the Vietnamese people. Opposed to what Dr. King had described as the madness of Vietnam, Youth for Action launched our own protest. 
Four of us guys sat in the auditorium wearing our black armbands while the four gals in our group protested by wearing theirs in their classrooms. As soon as the principal got word of our actions, we were all rounded up and heedless of the Supreme Court decision, faced suspension. More ominously, our names were quickly forwarded to the state police red squad. With parental support and threats of legal action against the school, we were soon reinstated, but for me, the incident generated more serious repercussions. I was a senior in high school, planning to go to college the next fall, and my history teacher, an ultra-conservative, pro-war ex-Marine, was also the head of our local draft board. Upon my return to school, he called me to the front of the classroom, jammed a finger into my chest, and threatened me in no uncertain terms, you, son, he declared, are going to Vietnam. What I had observed about the treatment of activists in the civil rights movement was now happening to me. Standing up in protest, even when legal, could lead to traumatic consequences. Luckily for me, my 18th birthday was in September, and I had gone to see a draft counselor who advised me that I could register for the draft where I went to college, and my high school history teacher would have no say over my draft future. So in the fall of 1969, I enrolled at the University of Wisconsin, known then not only for its strong academics, but for its strong student movement. During my first semester, I attended a life-changing two-week symposium focused on the tumultuous current events of the time, both in the U.S. and internationally. Two of the lectures, both on China, had a particularly profound effect on me. At that time of the Cold War, I knew almost nothing about the country behind the so-called bamboo curtain. But a historian from Wisconsin and an economist from Stanford each reported that remarkable social experiments were being launched there, efforts to alter fundamentally and systemically the values and practices of China's old society. By empowering the laboring classes with workers as managers, and managers as workers, by narrowing inequalities between men and women with the provision of jobs, childcare, paid maternity leave, reproductive rights, freedom of marriage and divorce, the sharing of household responsibilities, and the eradication of the sexualization of girls and women. By eliminating elitism in education and extending opportunities for study to those, the poor and the peasants, who had historically been excluded by overhauling the admissions criteria, no more entrance exams, students evaluated instead by the people from their localities, and restructuring curricula to serve social needs and social justice. By providing innovative, effective, affordable, and accessible medical care to all of China's vast population. In short, it was a society that was being built not on the material incentive to maximize profit, but on the moral incentive to serve the people. Profoundly, I was intrigued. Profoundly, this whole situation appealed to me. On many fronts, revolutionary China was capturing the imagination and attention of political activists in the US and around the world. Beginning with the visit in 1959 of NAACP co-founder and noted scholar W.E.B. Du Bois, Chinese leaders had held cordial meetings with a number of leading African-American activists, and Communist Party chairman Mao Zedong had twice, in 1963 at the time of the March on Washington and in 1968 after the assassination of Martin Luther King, issued strong statements of support for the black liberation struggles in America. The Black Panther Party was studying and popularizing the writings of Mao. And here in the one picture, you can even see that they had posters from China hanging in their offices. Beyond the African-American struggle, one of the first women's liberation organizations in New York City during the 1960s promoted the ideas of consciousness raising, which the activists derived from the experiences of Chinese peasant and women's associations that was documented in the widely read book at the time, Fan Shen. In France, 
Following the massive 1968 worker-student revolt, the intelligentsia there, too, gravitated toward the thinking of Mao and the experiences of the Chinese Revolution. Creators of the French New Wave cinema, Francois Truffaut and Jean-Luc Godard, were inspired by China. And two of the 20th century's most influential philosophers, existentialist Jean-Paul Sartre and feminist Simone de Beauvoir, joined with many others in spreading the ideas of Chinese socialism in the newspaper La Cause du Peuple. In short, the study of China captivated me. My interest only deepened when relations between the U.S. and China began to thaw and the American people got their first glimpse of the PRC. This happened during Richard Nixon's widely publicized trip to China in 1972. The following year, as a senior in college, I was elated when I was chosen to travel myself as part of a month-long study tour. In the intervening years since that time, I've had many other meaningful experiences, but while deepening, refining, and nuancing my values and understanding of the world, they have served largely to build on the fundamentals that had been established during my youth. So what about the present? In many ways, this country and the world have changed since my formative years in the 1960s. At that time, for example, we had no personal computers. The one computer at Wisconsin and the one computer at Cornell, where I first went to graduate school, each took up the space of a giant base basement room on campus. We had no cell phones. We actually had to literally dial landline numbers. We saw very few people of color on television no open same-sex relationships. Even married couples slept in separate twin beds. Examples of women newscasters, politicians, and professionals were almost nowhere to be seen. But many other features of society have changed little or worsened. Poverty remains widespread, and since the beginning of the 1980s, when the anti-regulatory neoliberal form of capitalism began to sweep the world, the concentration of wealth in the hands of the very few has grown exponentially, as has the gap between rich and poor, both in the U.S. and globally. Think about this. According to Oxfam, 82% of the wealth generated in 2017 went to 1% of the global population, while the poorest 50% of the world's peoples, 3.7 billion in number, received none of that wealth. And during this past year of pandemic, the trend has only accelerated. You can see that in this picture of Jeff Bezos, the world's richest person. During this pandemic year, the world's 2,365 billionaires enjoyed a $4 trillion boost to their wealth. While many of the most egregious examples of environmental pollution like Cleveland's Cuyahoga River catching on fire, were cleaned up after the emerging environmental movement of the 1960s contributed to the creation in 1970 of the EPA, today we still face the grim realities of environmental disasters, such as the Flint water crisis of 2014, which lingers to the present. And we are all aware of the increasing severity of the impacts of global climate change. As to gender issues, it's no doubt true that largely as a result of the women's liberation movement of the second wave feminism of the 1960s, many women have indeed achieved prominence, economic independence, and fulfillment through improved opportunities for work outside the home. But it nevertheless remains the case that equal pay for equal work is a goal yet to be realized. And although, as students in my gateway classes have attested, social norms have changed to expect husbands to share in cooking, cleaning, and childcare, the primary burden of the family is still shouldered by women. The job loss statistics during the recent or the current pandemic bear this out. In addition to the double onus of earning a paycheck and keeping house, women have the task of educating the kids. For many, the burden has simply been too much, and they've had to sacrifice jobs outside the home. Moreover, domestic violence has risen, and hard-won reproductive rights have been under attack. What about racism? Have we seen improvement on this front? The Black Panthers organized initially to defend their communities from police brutality and repression. 
This past year's experiences with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, just the most prominent of many examples, testifies to the ongoing injustices African Americans face all too often at the hands of the police. Since the 1960s, we have also witnessed the creation of a new widespread expression of racial subjugation, powerfully brought to light by Michelle Alexander in her book, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration. And the wealth gap, the environmental crisis, and the gender inequalities described above all hit people of color with more intense severity. Of course, the past year, as I indicated at the outset, has also witnessed resistance. Among the most thought-provoking and promising elements of this resistance has been a renewed emphasis on systemic causes. The wealth gap has been described as systemic plunder. Environmental threats and climate change are increasingly seen not only as Earth systems disruptions from the science side, but from the societal standpoint as systemic crises. The oppression of women has long been attributed to patriarchy as a system of male supremacy. And the subjugation of black people so strongly exposed by the Black Lives Matter movement has been identified as systemic racism. We have come to realize that altering individual behavior is not enough to solve the problems, to right the wrongs that we have faced throughout my lifetime and still face today. As an individual, I can and should attempt to help people in poverty. As an individual, I can and should attempt to reduce, reuse, repair, and recycle. As an individual, I can and should attempt to examine and check sexist behaviors in myself and those around me. As an individual, I can and should make every effort to combat racism as I encounter it in my personal experiences. But the point of looking at historically rooted and deeply entrenched problems systemically is to recognize three implications. One, that forces beyond individual attitudes and behaviors shape, limit, and ultimately determine outcomes. Two, if the problems are not primarily the result of individual actions, then the solutions must not be individual, they must be collective. And three, as sociologist Eduardo Bonilla Salva has pointed out, understanding systemic causes of our most pressing problems means, quote, finding solutions to match the nature of the problem. The solutions need to be systemic. A number of scholars and activists, both in years past and in recent times, have offered penetrating analyses and provocative solutions from a systemic pr perspective. Before concluding, I'd like to very briefly suggest such, a few such systemic approaches that might help us address three major issues of our times, racism, the environmental crisis, and the crisis in higher education. As to systemic racism, over the past year we have heard repeatedly that the, that the roots of American racism lie in the system of slavery. That much seems clear. But when did slavery, which has existed in various societies for thousands of years, become racialized? One of the clearest answers to this question was provided in 1944 by Oxford-trained Caribbean scholar Eric Williams in his seminal study, Capitalism and Slavery. Slavery, Williams demonstrated, arose from the early merchant capitalist need for plantation labor in the American colonies to produce most profitably tobacco, cotton, and especially sugar. The ideology of racism and its systemic practices in the Americas was thus created to serve and vindicate the economic exploitation of the plantation slave system of colonial capitalism. Slavery, Williams maintained, was not born of racism, rather racism was a consequence of slavery. Reading Williams, I was struck by parallel observations on the roots of systemic racism from other sources. Recall Martin Luther King's observation about capitalist profit-seeking in Latin America, Africa, and Southeast Asia, and Fred Hampton's identical contention that racism is a byproduct of capitalism. In Mao Zedong's 1963 and 1968 statements in support of the African-American struggles, the leader of China's anti-imperialist revolution similarly identified racial discrimination in the U.S. as, quote, a product of the colonial system. And in just the past few weeks, 
No less an expert on empire than Prince Harry himself, in his interview alongside his wife, Meghan Markle, pointed to colonial undertones in forming the racism in the royal family. Can Williams' analysis help us understand the origins and nature of systemic racism? Can it help us figure out a systemic solution? Many analyses of climate change and its related pathologies similarly point to systemic causes. Environmental historian, geographer, and sociologist Jason W. Moore is among a cohort of, of scholars who, in seeking the origin of today's conditions, have found evidence that it lay not in the period of the pollution pervaded industrial revolution, as many has, have assumed, but rather in the earlier period of colonization. Sound familiar? When capitalism not only began to change economic relations, but also the social and ecological fabric across continents. In concert with the analysis of Eric Williams, Moore sees the colonial system in its ideology of a limited humanity, limited to males of white European stock, with provenance over what he calls cheap nature, including women and colonized people along with other resources of the earth, as crucial to the accumulation of capital that was needed to stimulate and support industrial capitalism and that yielded resultant environmental harms, including ultimately global climate change. Can Moore's analysis help us understand the systemic origins and nature of the environmental crisis? Can it help us figure out a solution? The list of systemic crises goes on, but there's one more that I'd like to touch on today, the crisis in higher education. For the first time in my lifetime, college administrators and boards of trustees on a mass scale have generated a wave of program closures and faculty terminations. And in the past year, we at IWU have felt the cold force of this current too. Our programs in anthropology, French, Italian, and religion were eliminated, and seven of our colleagues in these programs were told that their jobs were terminated. All these professors were tenured, and two of them had even stood at this podium in years past as recipients of the university's award for teaching excellence. As this is an honors convocation, I would like to take a minute to honor these professors for their many years of service to IWU. Carol Moskowski, Rebecca Gearhart Mafazi, Chuck Springwood, Scott Sheridan, Chris Callahan, Jin Tao, and Nawa Chalagan. To these dedicated colleagues listed here, thank you for all your many significant contributions to our students and to our IWU academic community, both through your departments and through your participation in IWU's interdisciplinary programs, lending them a breadth and depth that will not be replaced. You will be deeply missed. In the case of this recent crisis in higher education, the origins may be more difficult to identify, but perhaps a clue has been offered in the past weeks by one of Illinois Wesleyan's most distinguished alumni, the internationally acclaimed poet, author, and ecological biologist, Sandra Steingraber. In late February, she was witness to a mass job termination of her faculty colleagues at Ithaca College. In protest, Dr. Steingraber stepped down from her position and in her public letter of resignation, turned for explanation of this crisis to a term coined by her fellow environmental scholar and activist, Naomi Klein. Disaster capitalism, Steingraber called it, as applied to higher education. In simple terms, disaster capitalism is the effort by private industries to take advantage of societal shocks in order to implement calculated free market policies that promise enhanced profits at the expense of the unfortunates who suddenly become victims of the economic force of the invisible hand. Can Klein's analysis help us understand the origins and nature of the crisis in higher education? Can it help us figure out a solution? Let me conclude. If we are willing to entertain the proposition that many of the seemingly intractable problems we face in the world today are in fact systemic, then we should be willing to explore, exhume, and examine the origins, 
historical contexts, and contemporary expressions of the systems at work. To solve the problems, we should first take steps to resist, but more, we should be eager to seek systemic solutions, combining imagination with intellectual rigor, creativity with concerted action. What better purpose can we have for an educational community? What better way to live up to Illinois Wesleyan's mission of diversity, social justice, and environmental sustainability? In the 1960s, vast numbers of activists in the US and China and around the world all tried hard, but in many regards fell short of the goals of bringing about systemic change. Or where they did bring about change, it was not to last. Nevertheless, even where we fell short, we left lessons to be learned, including some positive experiences to build upon. What efforts were well conceived and effective? What efforts were mistaken or misguided? Based on that knowledge, what strategies might bring about systemic solutions to address today's systemic problems? Can social movements like Black Lives Matter, climate justice, food sovereignty, and others become catalysts for systemic change? Do we need to build a new rainbow coalition to unite all the oppressed groups in society? Can the burgeoning mutual aid network play that role? Do we need to replace material incentives for maximizing profits with moral incentives to serve the people? What do we make of the potential for circular economies or the degrowth paradigm? What new projects can be invented and put into practice? So much exciting work is now underway to study systemic problems and come up with systemic solutions. Such work is imperative. The past year has alerted us that the whole world is calling on us to be part of it. There is no better time than as a college student to commit to the understanding of resistance to and ultimately elimination of systemic problems. The moment to take up the challenge is now. Well, by every measure, this past year has been one to remember. We've been through a painful process of programmatic review, never-ending belt tightening, and, of course, the continuing pandemic. But today, I'll give you one more reason to make 2021 a year to remember, and it's a good reason to make it memorable, because I get the honor and privilege to announce the 2022 recipient of the Kemp Award, Illinois Wesleyan's highest honor for faculty excellence. One look at the past recipients, and you'll know that the Kemper Award signals a career of sustained excellence. But those of you who served on PAT also know that the IWU faculty as a whole is quite accomplished, yet we don't always hear about all the remarkable things that our colleagues do. We tend to be a modest bunch. So earning this award signifies excellence on top of excellence. Now in the tradition of Kemp announcements, I will get on with the clues. Clue number one, our recipient works for Illinois Wesleyan University in Bloomington, Illinois. Clue number two, a nominator's letter provided compelling evidence for how our 2022 honoree inspires students' curiosity, love of learning, creative aspirations, idealism, ethical awareness, and sense of professionalism. The nominator notes, to be inspiring, you need to be passionate about what you do. If someone were to ask me to name IWU's most passionate faculty members, our awardee would be most definitely among them. For clue number three, I will provide a composite from observations of the colleague made by our nominators, by student contributors, and also from my own experience witnessing our awardee in action in the classroom. Our awardee is a natural teacher and instinctively knows how to draw out students' own intellectual curiosity. Whether it's the utterly mundane or the supremely sublime, the classroom experience is always one of lively engagement with the material at hand. Clue number four. 
This faculty member is known for being a tremendous resource to other faculty in brainstorming and offering up ideas for innovative pedagogical, pedagogical approaches. Clue number five, our awardee engages students beyond the classroom, whether on immersion trips to Chicago or entrusting students with important departmental responsibilities. The experiences are, for them, life-changing. A student writes, clue number six, that our awardee's enthusiasm for the humanities and dedication to students creates a perfect pedagogical storm and students are willing and excited even to sacrifice a bit of morning shut-eye in order to attend 8 a.m. courses. Clue number seven. Her initials are used by a prominent mid-20th century American author in place of his first name. Clue number eight. Our awardee is a true teacher scholar. In her field, being professionally active means that you can either produce creative work or publish in academic journals. Our awardee actually does both, and she does it exceedingly well. What she produces wins both awards and accolades from colleagues. Clue number nine, our awardee sports a fantastic Boston accent, and you will often catch her saying, watch this, or get a load of this as she provides an utterly engaging mini lesson on how to do something. Her enthusiasm is utterly contagious. Please join me in welcoming Professor, congratulating that is, Professor Joanne Diaz as the recipient of the 2022 Kemp Award for Teaching Excellence. Today, we want to honor those faculty who are retiring this year. Melinda Bauer, assistant professor in chemistry, Chris Callahan, professor in world languages, literatures, and culture, WLLC in French, Irv Epstein, professor in educational studies, Kathleen O'Gorman, professor of English, and Mike Weiss, professor of history. We'd also like to recognize two of our stalwart adjunct instructors, who have let us know that this will be their final year at IWU as they conclude their careers as educators. Cecilia Sanchez, adjunct instructor in WLLC, Hispanic Studies, and Emily Barr, adjunct instructor in sociology. Thank you all for your service and dedication to Illinois Wesleyan University.